when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice in that day, which is, of course, a crazy thing to do when you're being reviled. Rejoice in that day, for great is your reward in heaven. That's what that song said. We will rise, and it's the greatness of the reward. It's your best life later that makes all the difference in the world, too. That's a chapter in the, in the book. Um, one of the favorite phrases that the Apostle Paul uses is um, being rich in mercy, but God being rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us made us alive together with Christ. If you're alive tonight in Christ, you are loved with a great love. He only uses that phrase one time in all of his letters. A great love made you alive. You have to have a right theology to believe that. You didn't make yourself alive. God made you alive, and when he made you alive, it was an expression of great love, or you could say crazy, crazy love. While I was singing here beside Francis, one, one memory came to my mind, just, just to illustrate this phrase here. About uh, eight years ago, maybe, no, it was way longer than that. I was preaching through Hebrews, whenever that was. So Hebrews, that was before Romans. So Hebrews, and it was chapter, it was chapter uh, 11, and it was on Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. There was a young man named Tom. I won't give his last name just because just the missionary situation might be sensitive. If you're sitting right over, there, right over there where that guy in the white shirt is, that's where they always sat. Uh, he was in seminary, wondering what to do with his life, had given thought seriously to go in with Wycliffe Bible translators to a remote region with his wife and, and two kids, and his parents, the night before, Saturday night, had said to him, you're crazy. You're crazy if you do that. And I stood right here. This, this, I call these prophetic moments in preaching. I stood right here, and I'm preaching away, and he told me this later. I didn't know this. I didn't know this until years later, several years. I did. I'm saying to Abraham, he went out not knowing where he was going. I said, I looked around and said, that's crazy. He used those very words. He, he said, that ended. That just settled the deal. I mean, it was done. He's in, he's in Thailand today with his wife and, and kids. So these, these moments that are, that are crazy moments of, of prophetic love from God. He's, I've, I felt spoken to and loved by God and loved by this church. That's it. That's the answer I had to have this morning, and he's never turned back ever since then. So here, we're going to be studying this for the next 12 weeks or so. This is Francis's book, as you all know. That's why you're here, I suppose. Um, and, and I am thankful you're here. Um, he, he was the pastor, founded a church, founded a college, served the church faithfully, left it in good hands, is doing a new work in San Francisco, and uh, is, is a sweet and beautiful and, and crazy embodiment of what he's written here. So, Francis, come and tell us what God has told you to tell us. Thank you. Well, I have so many thoughts running through my mind right now. Um, first, I want to say hi to the people in the north. Uh, whatever that means. You got a campus in the north. I just had to say hi to you. So hello to the people in the north. They're in Duluth. Um, I have so many thoughts going through my mind right now because we, we just finished up the pastor's conference. and. And I came there thinking one thing and, and, and things that I was going to share and focused on my message. And then, then you hear these messages and uh, things started to, to just gnaw at me, different, different things where uh, the Lord just began to convict my heart. And uh, just, just praying, even praying for an opportunity, saying, God, this last night, saying, God, give me a chance to even put my, my weaknesses on display for the people to see. And, and he gave me an opportunity for that today. Um, so many thoughts running through my mind right now. Things that I need to deal with and do something with. 
Um, I, I remember when I entered into, uh, into seminary, one of the things our, our, our president warned us, he says, be careful. He goes, be so careful. You're going you're gonna to study this book, but be careful. Make sure when you hear something, when you read something, you better do it. When you're convicted about something, you better do something about it. He goes, because if you don't, the next time it'll be easier to study the word of God, be convicted and do nothing about it. Then pretty soon it becomes a habit to hear the word of God, study the word of God, be convicted by something and do nothing about it. It's a very, very dangerous, dangerous habit to get into. And so I try to apply that. Um, in seminary you can't because you're studying so much you can't apply it all. But, but for, the, for the most part, that, that's been a rule I try to keep in my life because I don't want to deceive myself. And so right now there are so many thoughts going on in my mind where I go, I've got to do something. I mean, today uh, was one of those, those humbling moments when uh, we had a little discussion there with the different speakers and they asked about our prayer lives at home with our wives um, about, you know, tell me about your daily devotion with your wife and your, your prayer time with your wife. And, you know, first I said, oh, it's great, it's wonderful, oh, it's glorious. How about you, Francis? And, and I, I, Lisa and I don't pray together that often. And that was uh, a little humiliating to admit that. Um, we have a great, great relationship She'll share with me the things that she's praying about and how God's working on her heart. I'll share with her the things that he's convicting me of and what I'm learning in the word, but the time together. And, uh, and, and just to, to, to have to say that and go, gosh, I was so convicted last night as I was listening about the importance of prayer in the home. And even times I knew that, that, that it, it's Satan that keeps us from praying with one another. And yet there's this awkward thing I've got going. I can pray with just about anyone except my wife, whom I love the most. And it's just a weird thing. It's an issue. It's whatever it is. And so convicted and thinking about that, thinking about that. And, uh, um, and, and, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so this afternoon I called her. And I said, you know what, honey, this whole thing has been about prayer, and uh, I, I'm just convicted. We, we need to pray together more. She goes, oh, that's, that's, that's great. That's great. And she was heading off to, uh, she goes, you know, I'm, I'm about to leave, and um, she was going out with uh, one of my daughters. We just moved to a new area, and, 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 and her daughter's new friend, you know, and, and her mom, the, the four of them were going to go out, and, and Lisa was going to try to minister to that family. I said, you know what, can we just pray over the phone right now? And uh, she goes, what? <laughs> I go, let's, just, let's just pray like right now over the phone. And it's the most awkward, like, ah, ah, uh, uh, you know, I pray that this, uh, I don't know. It's just like this, it's an awkward, I can pray with anyone, you know, but I know it's Satan that's keeping us apart. And it was fine afterwards. I was like, oh, okay, I did it, I did it, you know. <laughs> And, and I know that sounds so weird to you because you think, wow, but you're able to do this and this that seems like it requires so much faith. But we all have our struggles in these different areas. And, uh, and it's an interesting thing. But I, I bring that to your attention because yeah, there's just so many things on my heart, so many things I learned the last few days, and I just really want to do something with them and not deceive myself. Um, I, I want to say that it, it is a, it's an absolute, it, it really is. I don't just throw that out. It's an honor for me to be teaching from this podium, this stage. In my opinion, from this pulpit comes some of the best preaching on earth right now. And this yeah, it's an exciting thing. You can clap for it. Um, it's changed my life. It is. It's cause for celebration, but it is also cause for introspection. I want you to think about something. And I'm not saying this is what's going on here or whatever, so just remove this from the situation. I just want to ask a question. What would be worse if there was a church with terrible teaching and therefore there was very little Christian action, 
or if there was a church with wonderful biblical teaching and yet there was little Christian action. Think about that one. If someone asks you that question, you gotta check it off, you know, A or B, which is worse? I'm not saying I'm sure, but my guess is the latter. And my guess is that, based upon what, uh, what, what Jesus said in, uh, in Matthew 11, verse 21, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You'll be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. And there's something about when we are exposed to whom much has been given, that there's a requirement. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, when I look at my life, I go, well, I have heard a lot of good teaching and praise God for that. And, and it's a cause for celebration, but it's also a cause to go, okay, I've been given a lot. I've been taught a lot. And how does that play out in my life? And I, I there's, there's a sense, of, a little bit of an intimidation coming to a place like this and, and a, a temptation to assume certain things about you um, because of this place. And yet, uh, as I shared yesterday, I, I don't assume a whole lot anymore. Um, once you've been a pastor over three or four years, you learn not to assume certain things about certain people. And you realize, okay, outwardly, you guys all appear to be some great Christians. <laughs> you know, outwardly, you showed up on a Wednesday night. You came early, had a little fellowship meal together. You, you parked and you made it here and you could have died out there. It is unreal, <laughs> unreal. But you did that and you braved the weather. So there, there's these different things. And, and, and so, you, you know, you have this, it's easy to be, uh, to have an assumption, but I've been lied to so much. And I, I, you know, when you get into people's lives, as the elders have gotten into the lives of some of the people in the church, and they bring back stories, you know, we as elders at one point just said, you know what, we got to get into their lives more. We got to break it down and find out what's going on in people's lives. And it was shocking. It was so shocking. Like, what? what, what? No, 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 not him. No, not her. Well, are you kidding me? I, I, I see your face every Sunday. She's just like, ah, hey man, no. And you just find out, wow, amazing, amazing, amazing. And, and, but I, I mean, I praise God. I don't want to be like this downer right off from the start, but I, I, I just, I, I want to be careful because what a great reputation your church has and your, and your pastor. Um, I, I, I respect you more every time I hang out with you, every time I hear him. He's the one that caused me to really, really understand Christian hedonism. I didn't even had a clue about that, but just to understand how much joy and life can be found in the scriptures. I, he renewed my desire for scholarship and to study more deeply and to read more books and get more educated even at this phase in my life because it can lead to a greater passion and joy. And I hadn't seen that before. I really hadn't. So I praise God for that. What a wonderful, wonderful reputation this church has to hear that you guys were in India and everything else. But it makes me, uh, again, I, I, my mind goes to Revelation to just wondering some things. Because in, in Revelation 3, there's the church in Sardis. And uh, this, is, this is one that I have to deal with and I think you need to deal with it also. These letters, and the letter of what he said to the church in Sardis, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Because you've got this reputation. You have a reputation. I have a reputation. I have a reputation. And based upon my reputation, I don't think many of the men in that room today would have guessed that my wife and I don't pray together a whole lot.
We have reputations. You assume certain things about me. Some of you are here because of my reputation. And it's a scary thing because I, 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 I could be anything behind your back. See, you, you, don't, you don't follow me around. You don't know what's going on. Maybe I'm in San Francisco. You, you know? <laughs> what do you know? But, but I, I can ride this reputation. And you can ride a reputation. You, you go to Bethlehem Baptist. I'm going to assume certain things about you. And, and, and so here, he, he, here's Jesus speaking. He goes, I know. I know your works. I know the truth about you. You have a reputation. But Jesus himself says, but, but, but you're dead. I, I know the truth about you. Man, I've lied. I, I lived that. I, I confessed at the urban uh, pastor's gathering today. I go, gosh, there was a time in my life. Man, early on, there was just a deception. During that whole time when I was studying the scriptures, and yet I wasn't living it out. And yet I had a reputation. I had people fooled. A reputation of being alive. But ultimately, Jesus says, you are dead. He says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I'll come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you see, you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. Wouldn't that be awesome? To hear Jesus confess your name before the father and the angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Reputation. If I were to, because I don't know many of you at all, but let's say I just started interviewing you Maybe I'd interview the people closest to you, you know, your, your friends who are here with you today. And I asked them, tell me about David, you know, if, if there's a David out there. Tell me, tell me about David or whatever your name is. And I, and I asked your wife, David, I asked your kids, I asked your friends, I asked people who worked about you. Tell me about his relationship with God. Tell me what he's like. Tell me about, you know, who, who is this guy? Okay, think about that. If I interviewed the people close to you, what would they say? If I interviewed people in this church about you, what would they tell me? Okay, think about that. Some of the people in this church might say some very nice things about you, right? People in your Sunday school, people that have been on missions trips with you, people that, that were at the dinner table with you. Think about what they would tell me about you. What would they say? What's your reputation? And, and maybe Pastor John knows you, and I would ask Pastor John, wait, 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 tell, me what, tell me about this guy, what you know about him. Tell me about this woman, what you know about her. And think about the report I would get by interviewing those people. Okay, you got it got in your mind? We have an idea of what they would say. Okay, now what if, what if God would allow me right now to just leave this earth and come before his throne and I could actually interview him and ask him about you? Father, tell me, tell me about, tell me about David. What, what are your thoughts about him, his actions, his life, his, his love for you? And I just kind of took down a report. What would the two reports look like? Well, would this one report, would, would what your friends and your family and the people around say about you be much higher than what God would say? And, and if so, could it be that you've been more consumed about your reputation than you are about your character and who you really are? before God, and, and you, you, you maybe purposefully, we can do this, right? Make ourselves sound better than we are to certain people and create a reputation for ourselves. 
that may indeed be false when we stand before God. And we know it. And we know it. What God would say about us in many ways. And sure, sometimes we even deceive ourselves on that. But for the most part, we know, right? And that's what he says to these people. And, and that, that, that verse is very dear to me because I now have a reputation. And I want my life to match up. I don't want, at the end, God to say, wow, that's good. Ooh, Mr. Crazy Love. Y you know? <laughs> but for Jesus to confess my name and say, no, Francis, he, he, he loved me. He loved me. Father, angels, Fran here's Francis. He loved me. He, he, he didn't go these other directions. It, he lived it out. <laughs> Isn't that what you would love to hear from the voice of Jesus? That's what we're after. And, and so if it comes across me just going, wow, this guy doesn't even know me. He's getting in my face already. It, it's because I, I want that for you. I mean, oh, what a silliness. There's such a silliness to fake when something so big is on the line. Something so grand is on the line. I, I sometimes just tell people, I go, why would you fake? Think of, take it to the end. You, you know, take it to the very end. You fooled everyone. That's great. And so you die and you go to hell and you think, yeah, but everyone thinks I'm in heaven. <laughs> That's your goal? How long is that joy gonna last? You guys, it's this, it's, 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 it's this time to get real. It's, it's just a time for us. We gotta get honest with some of our disbelief. Uh, be honest with our fear of surrender. To be honest with some of the concern we have of the incongruency of what we see in New Testament, Testament Christianity and what we see in our own lives. That's what led me to write Crazy Love. That's what led me to, to enter into ministry. In fact, the, the, the passage that, that led me into ministry it was, was, uh, was Matthew 7, 21. I know that's been preached here. Pastor John preached it at, at the Passion Conference, and it hit me again. Well, well there'll be those who, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and yet some are gonna say, but, but didn't we do these deeds in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Wait a second, but, but didn't I have reformed theology? And he says, no, nah, apart from me, I never knew you. There was not, there was not a, a love, a, a relationship. I mean, you, you may have had the reputation of it, it's a scary, scary passage because I, I would go, gosh, I'm looking around and I know my friends at school, the way they act, and then they come to church and I'm going, uh, and I'm not, not to judge. It's, it's more just a fear, like a concern. It's, it's like someone jumping out of the plane and, and, and I'm going, that looks like, that doesn't look like a parachute, it looks like a backpack. I, 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 I think you're gonna pull that. It's not a judging. It's just, I'm deeply concerned about that Hello Kitty thing on your back. It's not gonna work. That's what this was. It, was. it was in the church going, gosh, they're making assumptions. They think that God loves them. I'm not seeing the fruit in their lives. And it was a concern, a deep concern. And as a pastor for, for the last 16 something years, I, 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 my congregation knows I, I, I care very deeply about that. I, I, I wake up at night concerned about that. I've, I've looked people in the eyes, including my own child, and said, I am so concerned about this because I don't see the real thing. And, and I, I'd hate to not say anything. I'd hate to just celebrate with you and assume certain things because this is the most important thing to me. This is what got me into ministry. Um, There were just times when I would read this book and then I would sit around in a church service and I would just think, 
That seems like two different things. What I see today and what I see in here. And, and yet I would never say anything because, you know, initially I would just think, well, I'm, it seems like I'm the only one that's bothered by it. Everyone else is smiling. Everyone else is happy. And so let me just go on with it. Go on with it. But it would, it would just nag at me until I finally started saying things and speaking up more and more. And then a few years ago, I, I, I still remember when I turned, when I turned 40, I, I just... You know, I just thought to myself, you know what? Just say what you need to say. You're practically dead. Just, just say it. You know, I mean, really, how much longer are you going to live? And, and so I just go, you know what? Okay, here's what I'm concerned about. Here it is. I, I, you guys ever wonder? Do you ever read the Word of God? And when you're alone, you just, you just go, gosh, that sure seems different. That sure does not seem like what I've experienced. Has that ever bothered you? And then, and then, then you think, well, but if I say something, everyone's going to think I'm crazy or I'm judging or whatever else. It's just, I can't help it. When I'm alone with that book and I read it, and, and just with just, just God and not just the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and as I study, I just go, gosh, it seems different. Seems like it's speaking a different language sometimes. And I just began to share and, and say what I was thinking thinking and what I'd been studying and I remember just asking people, I go, have you ever thought that? And everyone just, just kind of opened their eyes and go, yeah, I've totally thought that. I can't believe you said that. I, I, I thought I was the only one. And, 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 and when I thought I was writing a book for a few individuals that might have felt that and thought that, it, the, the circulation of the book showed me, wow, a lot of people have thought this. Okay, a lot of people have thought this. A lot of people have wondered about this. There should be a tremendous difference. Like what Pastor John was saying earlier about the person who is alive now, filled with the Spirit, right? There's a big difference between my dad and I. Big, big difference. My dad's dead. He's uh, been dead for 30 years. He's in a coffin. He just lays there. Here I am. Big difference. Big difference. Shouldn't there be a big difference between someone who is dead in their trespasses and sins and then another person? So, so one person does not have the Holy Spirit of God in them. They're dead in their trespasses and sin. They're, they're enslaved by a different master. And then someone else, who, who, the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is now in this person and not in that person. This person is dead in their trespasses and sins. And this person is alive. He's been regenerated. He's been transformed. He's got a new heart. Everything about it. He's a new creation. The old is gone. New thing. I mean, shouldn't you see it? You know? And then I would go, gosh, it seems when I see in Scripture, there should be a pretty marked difference between a believer and an unbeliever. And I would look around the church again. I go, I'm getting really concerned. I, 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 I get, it's, it's, I, please understand. It's not like I'm judging, go, oh, I'm so much better than you. So I, 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 it was first, let me look at my own life. Am I really that different? And if not, God, what have I not surrendered to you? What is it? I am concerned about me first and foremost. I'm going to be honest. I care about me more than anyone. As much as God has changed me and I am about his glory and I do love other people when it comes to salvation, I still don't get the Romans 9 thing where Paul talks about how I, I'd rather be accursed for their sake. Oh man, I, he hasn't brought me to that point yet. You know, I still care very much that I, I am right with him. And so I do look at that and I get, get, got concerned about it. But I go, no, 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 I, I know the spirits in my life. I've seen the fruit. Yeah, there, there's still sin. There's still issues. But I, I know what God's done in my life. And he has changed me. And, and I, I know how he listens to me. And when I pray to him, it's like, wow, Lord, you love me. Uh, 
Uh, you know, someone during the conference mentioned that Abba Father, you know, when your spirit cries out, that Galatians 4 just goes, Abba Father. I don't even know how to explain it, but even right before I, I spoke the last time, I just in the back, I just, it, it's like this childlike, oh, Dad, I just love you. I can't even stand it. I, I, I don't know how in the world I'm going to tell these people how wonderful we have it and how, how in love with how to, ah, I'm crazy about you. I get that there if they're not there because this is so good and my soul just crying out Abba Daddy I, I, I don't know how to explain it I just know that verse is true and then I've experienced it how do you explain your spirit crying out Abba Father um, it, it may be totally different for you but I know what it's talking about and so there's this peace and it's like yeah 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 and there's issues like I've shared, but man, I know, I know he's the Lord of my life. I know I have a new master. I know my spirit cries out, Daddy, Abba, Father. And I know that we're in love. It's not about a reputation. But sometimes I'd look around and I'd go, oh, I'm deeply concerned because I love. This is, this is, it's not a judgment, it's just love. I mean, do you really believe? Probably the first verse you learned that God so loved the world. You, love, you believe that? That he gave his only son, his one and only son, his only begotten. That whoever, anyone, whoever, believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Can you believe that? So you believe that about yourself. Or you go, you know what? I've got eternal life. Because I know I believe in him. And the Bible says, whoever believes in him. I mean, do you believe those words of scripture? Just, just John 3, 16. I, I mean, you're assured of that. Like, yeah, that's the word of God. So I can be assured. Because whoever believes him Whoever believes in him, anyone, I, I, I fit in there. So I got eternal life. I'm not going to perish. I don't die. Shoot me, I'll show you. I, I, I just, I, I, I don't, my body, my physical body, yeah, that, but I, I don't really die. There's nothing to fear. It's awesome. It takes away the sting of death because whoever believes has eternal life. You believe that, right? It's the word of God. That phrase, whoever believes, is also in John 14. Same phrase. Looked it up. John 14, 12. Truly, truly. So it's, it's definitely true. Truly, truly. I say to you, whoever believes in me. There it is again, right? Whoever believes in me will have eternal life. Whoever believes in me will never perish, but have eternal life. And now he's saying, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Wow. You believe that one? Really, you believe that about yourself, that you're going to do the works that Jesus did and even greater ones? See, it's a, these were some of the things I would wrestle with, with going, okay, that's the same phrase, saying the same thing, whoever believes in him. Yeah. I, so that means I'm going to do the same things the Father did. I'm going to do the works that God did did the things that Jesus did while he was on the earth and even greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. See, we'll say we believe John 3, 16. I believe, therefore, I'm going to go to heaven. The Bible also says, I believe, therefore, I'm going to do the things that Jesus did and even greater things than these. So if you believe the, the prior verse, do you see evidence of the latter verse in your life? Let's be honest with these things. Let's be honest if there's an incongruency here and you go, wow, Lord, maybe I've doubted what you could do through me. I, I, I've struggled with insecurity because I look at myself rather than looking at the word of God. 
or I look at other people and I compare myself to them rather than to the Word of God, rather than looking at how God uniquely made me, rather than believing in the spirit that he placed inside of me. Revelation 3, again, going back to that, the other letter that led me to ministry, that led me to write the book, was the church in Laodicea. You know, it was nice in Sardis, at least there were a few names, a few people that he says, okay, look at these guys, that's a real thing, come on, come on in. But the church in Laodicea threw me for a loop because it seems like he's speaking to the whole church and he doesn't point out a few individuals there. And I kept thinking, wow, what if I lived there? Could I have really stuck it out? Could I have really noticed it? Because he says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, I know your works. Again, you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Okay, and, and, and this is what bothers me. I, I, I looked at this passage, I spent some time digging in this passage, and the reason why was it seemed like there was a, there was a way that believers, uh, people, nominal believers, people in, in that fill church buildings would, would speak about this phrase, the lukewarm. And it was used very casually. And there was this phrase, the lukewarm Christian. And as I looked at this passage where we get the term lukewarm, I I said, I I don't see that possibility in this passage. Okay, understand something. I'm not saying that, that as believers we're perfect, we'll never sin again. Okay, and that there aren't times when we will struggle and do this or that. I'm not even judging those things. I'm just struggling with this term that we've coined, oh, I'm a lukewarm Christian, based upon this passage where we get the term lukewarm. Because according to this passage, because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. See, when I look at that phrase, I will spit you out of my mouth, that didn't seem like a good thing. It didn't seem like something he would do to believers spit them out of his mouth. And people question me on this. How can you say there's no such thing as a lukewarm Christian? I'm going, how can you say that there is? Aren't you getting the phrase lukewarm from Revelation 3? And he says these people who are lukewarm are spit out of his mouth. I don't believe that's a Christian. But then he goes on to say, for you say I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. Is that how you describe a Christian? Do you see that in other places in Scripture where God describes us who have been redeemed, those of us who have been rescued, those of us who become new creations? Are we referred to as those who are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked? So you would say, oh, that describes a believer. I once was blind, I'm still blind. (laughs) I sing that all the time. (laughs) I look at the adjectives, I look at that, and then he goes on in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. These were people who couldn't see. These were people who were not clothed in the white garments, not clothed in, the right, in, in righteousness. And so I'm looking at this passage. Where, where in this passage would you go, okay, but I think they're believers. So they're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. They're gonna be spit out of the mouth of God. Lukewarm. 
In verse 19, I love this. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. And I'll eat with him and he with me. What's, what's the answer? Try harder, work harder? He goes, no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm knocking. Let, let me into your life. Let me, because I'll transform that heart of yours. I'll change it. I'll change it from this heart of stone and turn into a heart of flesh. You know, right now you're just a slave to your sin. I'll, I'll give you a new master to where you, you, it's like you have to do the right thing. Otherwise it bothers you, it grates at you. I'll give you a whole new master. I'll put that spirit in you. It's not about work. It's about him coming in and changing your life. It's about you believing that whoever, if you believe this, that he, he really could come into you and change you and transform you. Do you hear his voice? He says, then open the door and I'll come in. I'll eat with you and you with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, this, this church in Laodicea, this, uh, this group of people, God says, I, I, I gotta say, you know, you're, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out. Um, you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. But, but here's my counsel to you, come to me, come to me. I'll, I'll, I'll clothe you, I'll clothe you. I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you real riches. Um, I'll I'll come in, I'll dine with you. I'll make you an overcomer. And then one day you're gonna sit on that throne with me and I don't know what that means, I just know it's a good thing. A lot better than being spit out of his mouth. See, I look at a passage like that, I go, wow, that's some serious, serious stuff. That is some serious stuff. And I gotta take heed to it and I pray for other people. And again, it's not like the church in Sardis where he points out, here's some people who pulled it off. I, I, I look at that, that gathering there and I think, wow, but if everyone was like that, how would you know that, like would I have known? That's what made me wonder about myself. Well, people lift me up as a leader, but they probably had leaders out there that they lifted up. It's, it's, and I use this illustration for it. It's, it's like when I was in college. When I was in college, I went back to Hong Kong to visit my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was so happy, so happy that I came to visit her. You know, and she was just, when I got there, it was, um, it, it was awesome because she was just so proud. Like, wow, look, you know, showing me off to all of our relatives. Look, my grandson came and, and visited me. And I'd be like, big deal, you paid for it. it you know, but, but she was just proud. You know, he came from the States to visit grandma. And the moment she would introduce me to any of my relatives, any of her friends, it was the exact same response by them. They would look at me and go, wow, kum dai jaga. Wasn't that crazy? And um, <laughs> I had to learn your language. Um, but what, uh, I'll tell you what it means. What, 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 it, what they would say though, and you know, if you translate that, it, same thing, everyone would say, they go, wow, he's so big. Look at me. <laughs> but, but honestly, at that time, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, when I, about 25 years ago, when I would walk around in Hong Kong, literally two weeks I was there, I did not see a single person taller than me. It's changed now. I don't know, they're drinking milk now. But, but back then, <laughs> seriously. And it wasn't even like I'd have to stand next to them. It'd be like, wow. So, so everyone that saw me was like, wow, he's so big, he's so big, you know? And I didn't have the heart to tell him, it's not that I'm so big. <laughs> it's, you're so small, you, you know? 
it's, 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 you know, grandma, you, your friends, your buddies, you know, it's, it's, this is a strange place on the planet. It's not like this everywhere. I'm just big because I'm here. Gosh, back home, you should see me. You should see my friends. And, and, and see, that's what I think of when I look at this passage and I think, okay, what if I was in Laodicea? What if I lived there and people said, oh, there's Francis Chan. But would it be that I'm lifted up because everyone else was so lukewarm? That even a tiny hint, and could it be that we're in a place where, wow, just the, 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 the people who call themselves Christians in America so fit this description that any sense of, wow, you give 10%, well, let's put your, your name on a plaque. Wow, you, 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 have, you have regular devotions. Wow, you pray. You, 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 know what, you know what I'm talking about? Like there was this, wow, maybe it's like... Maybe, is it that I'm so big? Is it that I'm so holy? Is it that I'm so spiritual? Or is it that I live in a place that's so materialistic that we can't even see straight? So into comfort that any little ounce of godliness gets lifted up or any semblance of that. See, those were the things I began to ask myself and dig deeply in those scriptures and go, okay, Lord, let me test myself. Let me examine myself to see if I'm the real thing. That's what the book was about. That's what my journey was all about. And, uh, and it was exciting because it felt like I struck a chord in there somewhere. And it's nice when you don't feel alone, right? And other people go, that's why I wrote it, because I thought, I know other people think this. And so let me just encourage those few people that have wondered these things and have looked deeply in their lives because this is something very important to them and I've told people, look, if you go, yeah, I'm lukewarm, I'm lukewarm, that's, that's not something you just casually say. <laughs> that's something that better be changed. Don't go to work tomorrow unless that's changed. I, I, I mean, I, and let's not throw this term around, like, yeah, he's a lukewarm Christian, she's a lukewarm. That doesn't make sense. Use something else, something that's more biblical that could possibly describe whatever you're talking about, but don't use that phrase here. Look, I, um, I've got all sorts of notes, and for some reason right now, it's not making sense for me to go there. I'm not ready to close. I feel like I need another five or 10 minutes, but I'd like to pray right now because I'm not quite sure what to say, and I want to say the right thing. So would you just bow your heads and, and just pray for me right now? Pray that the next words out of my mouth would be right. God, I need you so badly right now. I'm asking you to just do what you need to do with your word now. Give me the words to say or teach me to be quiet. I don't want to just speak because I'm supposed to or even because I said I would. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's, here's what I believe I'm supposed to say, and it's not even going to take five minutes. And it's more of a prayer. I didn't want to just say it in my prayer to be teaching during my prayer. My prayer is this, that 
I don't want anyone in this room who has been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, who is a temple of the Holy Spirit, to doubt their salvation. I don't want that. I don't believe the Spirit wants that of us. And I don't want anyone who is unsaved, dead in their trespasses and sins, to believe that they are saved. (laughs) And that's my prayer to you, Father, that you would now take these words and and do just that. Because if, if you don't know Jesus, know him, and there's an element of faking that, I just want that to change tonight. I, I, what an awesome thing to think that maybe a, a hundred years from now you could look at me and say, remember that night at Bethlehem Baptist? That's when it all changed. You preached at a Revelation 3 and I said, wow, that is me. You preached Matthew 7. I said, wow, that's me. You preached about the church in Sardis. I thought, that's me. And I said, oh God, Come, come in. Come into, come into this life. I, I need a new heart. I want to be all about you and your glory. And I want it to be the real thing. I don't want to just regurgitate what I've heard others say from this stage. I want it about you and me. I want my spirit to cry out, Abba, Father, like what Francis was crying out and talking about. I don't even get that but I want that and I want you to tell me that a hundred years from now and us to celebrate a hundred years from now. Wow, that's awesome. That was the night it all changed, huh? And so I'm not set for, I don't know, that we're set for some sort of response time or whatever else. Um, If the Lord is stirred on your heart, you'll, you'll figure out how to respond and You'll tell the right people. And so, uh, let me actually pray that now as I finish my time. (sighs) Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It is all about you, O sovereign God, who's known everything in the past, everything in the future, and here we are, this one little blip in eternity. You, know, you, you knew it all. You knew everyone that was gonna be here, everyone that's watching on the other campus, everyone that's watching on the internet, and you ordained it. You had them born the right day and living during this time of technology to hear this word even through the internet. It was all ordained by you. You knew it. They were going to hear this message this day. And I am asking for a supernatural. I am asking for the miraculous. I'm asking that your Holy Spirit now would move through your word to encourage and uplift those who are saved, to rejoice in their salvation because they have the greatest treasure they could ever have, and now move into the hearts of those who have been deceived, that they would attain that gift, that free gift, and open that door, accept you now, that you would change them and they would live for your glory, be conformed to the image of your Son, all to the praise of your glorious name, that we would be together with you forever and ever. Thank you, Jesus, you are so worth it. God, you are so worth it, so wonderful. I love you. I love you, Abba Father. I am so secure in you. It is so wonderful to know you.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.